Welcome back, everybody. This is another episode of the Exodus Project. I'm your host, Steve Eisenhower, and today we are going to discuss the scared Jesus um, and how when in the face of trouble upon his divinity claims, he turned tail and ran. Um, But before we get started, hit that subscribe button. Turn on the notifications, give me a big thumbs up, and please check the description for any resources you may need. Uh, Question form down there, as well as my new book. The link is available for the hard copy, as well as um, an ebook version. If you just shoot me an email at rediscoveringgod22 at gmail.com, I will happily email you your own free copy of the Christian Coloring Book. So let's get right into it. The Scared Jesus. So, we see in the 10th chapter of the book of John. So, at the time, at that time, the Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah, took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. Okay, so now we know exactly what we're talking about here at the time of Hanukkah. And Jesus is walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. Okay. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, mind you, this is the Jews, okay? Other places you have, the scribes and Pharisees, now we're in the book of John, it's just the Jews. All the Jews are being demonized. How long will you keep us in suspense, right? They wanted to know if he's the Messiah. If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Um, Christians often cite Isaiah 53, of course, about Jesus, and it says that no deceit will be in his mouth, right? Well, we see right here that clearly the Jews were wanting to know, like, listen, man, if it's you, let us know, you know? So it's it's pretty clear he wasn't being entirely truthful um, if he's being approached by by the Jews and being asked, like, hey, if, if it's you, let us know, because Rome's kind of kicking our butts right now. <laughs> um. And Jesus said to them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you're not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So, basic Christian understanding, we see here that Jesus is making a divinity claim. Okay? Let's see where it goes from here. Verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. He made a divinity claim, compared himself to God, said, I and the Father are one. Okay, well, big no-no. Jesus answered them and said, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? So that Jesus gets smart about it. What are you going to stone me for? Everything I've done, all these miracles I've done, have been um, good. These have been good miracles I've done. What are you going to st- which one are you going to stone me for? The Jews answered, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you. Okay. We're not going to stone you because of your miracles but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. I and the Father are one. I give my sheep eternal life, right? They said, listen, we don't care about your miracles. Do all the miracles you want. But as soon as you make a divinity claim, as soon as you, a man, say you're God, it's coming for you, pal, right? I mean, because they they would have known the Torah, Right? They would have known Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. They've known 1 Samuel 15. The glory of Israel cannot lie, for he is not a man. And Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. So what's he citing there? Well, we're going to get into that. And further, it's written in the Psalms. Not, not, in, not in the law. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? 
So he's basically, Jesus' retort here is, if your own scriptures say that, um, if your own scripture says that the people who God speaks to can be called gods, then how can you say, I'm blaspheming, right? Because I said, I am the son of God. If I'm not doing the works of my father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe in the works. So even if you don't believe in me, at least believe the miracles. That you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Okay, seemingly another divinity claim. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped their hands. Okay, so he's making these divinity claims. He actually misquotes a scripture and attributes it to a wrong place in the Tanakh. And... They, as a body, hear this, and they pick up stones, and they're they're ready to uh, they're ready to kill him for being a false prophet, right? For saying he's God. But what's funny is, it says he escaped from their hands. He ran away. Why would he run away? If he's this all powerful divine being, why not just stop them, right? Why not just? Or heck, if he has to die, and he really wants to prove to the Jews that I'm your Messiah. Why not let them kill him? And he just comes back to life right in front of their faces and wham, bam, okay, wow, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, but no, you don't have any of those scenarios. Rather, he runs away after, like I said, misquoting and misappropriating a, uh, a scripture, which to me, it, it really goes to show that whoever was authoring this just didn't really have a grip on how Hebrew works or how um, Judaism works. Um, but if there's anything to be, if, if there's anything to be teased out here that is legitimately true, if this was a historical event that he did make these divinity claims and the Jews wanted to stone him as according to the Torah would tell them to, um, and he ran away, he must have known it's because, okay, they have the authority to do so. And why do I say that? Well, as we move on, here's the verse that he misquoted. He said, it's in the law but rather it's actually the 82nd Psalm, um, a Psalm of Asaph. God stands in the congregation of God, meaning God is amidst his people, Israel, and he judges among the judges. Okay? In that verse, judges is Elohim, referring to the leaders of Israel. Right? So not only does God dwell among his people, the whole nation of Israel, but he also judges the leaders of Israel. If they're not making the right decisions, he's going to, he's going to judge them for it, right? So he's expecting, he's expecting um, correct judgment in accordance to the Torah, uh, and that's that's really what Jesus, and that's what Jesus cited there because the word is Elohim. That means gods and God, gods in other places. Uh, the author of John or Jesus in this, whoever, whoever actually said it, is misappropriating this and saying that Psalm 82 means that anyone who judges is a divine being, right? And that's not what it's talking about. And I can back that claim up because we have other verses in the Bible that use this word for judges, but never, never implies that they're divine. Okay, so he's saying I can make a divine claim because even your Bible says that people in authority are divine, but the Jews who sought to stone him because this is blasphemy knew better than that, right? They're scholars. They know their Torah. Exodus 21, 6, then his master shall bring him to the judges. Once again, the word Elohim. He shall also bring them, him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his heel with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So the context there is if a uh, Eved, Eved Ivry, a, a Jewish slave, wishes to stay as a slave or an indentured servant under the master that he was repaying. Okay? So the whole context there is if, if that's what you want to do, okay, then you have to come to the Sanhedrin, the judges, those who are the ruling body over the people as Deuteronomy 17 says is the proper protocol that the the teachers, the Levites, the priests, and the judges all, which make up the Sanhedrin, will issue these judgments and make decisions halakhically on behalf of the people. Okay? 
So what it's saying here is, as I just mentioned, if you want to remain a slave, an indentured servant, an evid, a servant to your master, then you have to come before the judges and you have your ear pierced, signifying that that's what you are doing. Okay, just a little bit of context to show that that word is not exclusive for God, but does in fact mean judges, human judges, in, in fact. Okay. Exodus 22, 7. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges, once again, the word Elohim, to see whether he has put his hand to his neighbor's goods. For every kind of trespass, whether it be for an ox, an ass, a sheep, a garment, or any kind of lost thing, which another challenges to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, Elohim, and whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double to his neighbor. So once again, judges, that same word, in no way is this meant to be that, um, in no way is it meant to be that these two people on either side of this of this uh, theft issue come before some divine council in heaven. No, it means that they come before the ruling, the the judgment, the supreme court, I guess you could say, of of the leaders of Israel, and they issue a judgment based upon the halacha. That's just how Judaism was set up when God gave his when when God gave his perfect his perfect Torah and his laws and commandments on how this society of Israel is meant to function, this is how this is how he did it. Right? So once again, just to weigh just to uh, hit home that point that Jesus was misappropriating what Psalm says, um, it simply just goes to show that Jesus, these judges have the powers, right? They have the authority to issue these judgments, and that's what you're going to listen to. First Samuel 2.25, if one man sins against another, the judge, Elohim, shall judge him. Okay, so if, if, you ju- if you sin against your fellow man, then you're under the, you're under the jurisdiction, right? You're under the authority of the human court system. Okay, and that's what it's saying here. But if a man sins against Hashem, who shall entreat for him? However, they listen not to the voice of their father, because the Lord intended to slay them. Okay, so the basic takeaway there is, if you sin against your fellow man, you have to go to those humans who are in authority. But if you sin against um, the Lord, that's a different story. Okay, once again, showing that this person is in fact a human with human God-given authority, uh, but not God's, not divine. Okay, it's it's saying that your authority comes from the powers, not that you are some type of divine, divine being, which is how Jesus in, in, appropriates it in John ten, that, well, hey, your Bible, your own scriptures say that, you know, those who judge other judge others are divine. So why are you trying to stone me for saying the same thing? Okay. So this is why they're trying to stone him. All right. And it, it almost fits like a glove perfectly on how the protocols went. Okay. So Jesus is saying, I do all these miracles, right? Believe the miracles. If you don't, even if you don't believe in me, at least believe in the miracles, right? And they're like, no, we don't care about the miracles. We're not here to stone you for the miracles. We're here to stone you because you say that you're divine. You're only a man, but you're calling yourself God, right? And he's like, oh, well, trust the miracles. Well, this is what they're hanging their hat on. This is the authority they're acting in, Torah-given authority, and they are well within their parameters and well within their rights. And I do believe Jesus understood that, and that's why he ran away, because he knew what he was doing was wrong, according to Deuteronomy 13, and according to the God-given jurisdiction to the Elohim, the human judges who can make these judgments and really just ignore the miracles, because as we're about to see in this, in this chapter, they don't prove anything. Okay, so Deuteronomy 13, verse 2. If there arises among you a prophet, Jesus, or a dreamer of dreams, and gives you a sign or a wonder, right? Trust my miracles. And the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. Okay? Someone comes along and he's doing miracles. All right, fine. But once he says something that goes against the Torah message, right? As soon as he said, I am a man... And one with God, I and the Father are one. You know, I, 
I have the power. God gives me the power to give people eternal life, to give my sheep eternal life. That goes against this, and that goes against what they knew from Sinai, what their fathers knew, okay? And they rightly rejected it. Verse 4, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for it's only the Lord God testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall not serve him. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to thrust you out of the way which the Lord your God commanded you to walk in. Let's think about, let's think about Christianity. We understand that jo- Joannine literature is late, right? So it has a bit more of that cr- Jesus divinity in it. Um, well, let's think about the routes Christianity took. The routes Christianity took, whether it be Paul's doing or Jesus' doing, whichever, The routes that Christianity took and what it grabbed onto was an abolition of the Torah. Okay? That's that's the bottom line. So if if Jesus was saying he was divine, even if he said, you know what, keep the Torah, but I'm a I'm a man God, I'm divine in some way, and my miracles prove it, that goes against this. Okay? You don't worship a man. Alright? And it's blasphemy to say I as a man am God. All right. So you shall purge that evil away from the midst of you. If your brother, the son of your mother... Now, isn't that interesting? Okay, we understand that to be a Jew, you must be born of a Jewish mother. Right? But according to Christianity, which human parent does Jesus have? A mother. Right? If your brother, the son of your mother or your son or your daughter, or the wife of your bosom, or your friend, which as is as your own soul, entice you secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which you have not known, nor your fathers. Okay? That's the enticement. We're seeing the correlation here, right? That there's a divinity claim. There's he. Jesus tells them, as we read in John 10, he's... He's saying, you're not of my sheep, right? My sheep know my voice. Uh, I and the Father are one. I have the ability to give them everlasting life. Uh, the Jews are hearing this and they're like, yo, this this just isn't right. There's something off about this. You can't be, you can't be saying I and the Father are one, right? You can't be saying that, you can't be making divinity claims. And I know there's going to be people that talk about in the Garden of Gethsemane where... You know, forget that. We see why the Jews are trying to stone him. It's clear he was making divinity claims, and you as Christians believe he's divine. So that's a self-defeating argument. So if we can, so if we can understand he's making divinity claims, then clearly the Jews, according to the Torah, according to Halacha, and the way God intended it, are making the right decision when they say, listen, this isn't right, your miracles don't matter, and they pick up stones and they're ready to, they're ready to stone him. Okay, so verse 11, this is, the, this is the punishment for someone who does this. And you shall stone him with stones that he die, because he has sought to thrust you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. So just as the Torah prescribes, just as the Torah says, this is what you do when you have someone who does this, John 10 says that's what they did. And Jesus ran away. If he was really this all-powerful man, God, why not stop them? Uh, honestly, the uh, the Christian understanding and the position of the New Testament is he couldn't lay his... The only way his life could be taken from him, it wasn't taken, he had to lay it down willingly, right? So, realistically, if, if he had to lay his life down willingly, right? If legions of angels would be sent to catch him if he jumped off the temple or whatever that, whatever that was... Um, why could he just not stay their hands? Why run? Was it was it because he's a coward? Was it because he knew that the, what they were doing was in a, in alignment with what the Torah says you're supposed to do for someone that does what I'm doing, right? 
he understood that there was there was jurisdiction to do exactly what they were doing right so if he really had these if he really had that power why not just stop them why not just stay their hands well i think it's because he couldn't and he knew he was wrong okay so origin in contra kelsum all right this is a third really a third party source on behalf of kelsum which is going to say you know going to show that even at that time there were stories circulating of what was going on and why. So let's read this. And since in imitation of a rhetorician training a pupil, he introduces a Jew. All right, this is in Contra Kelsum, just some TLDR. Uh, Contra Kelsum is basically origin coming against a pagan apologist, basically a pagan philosopher who uses different arguments to come against Christianity. And at times he even says, this is what the Jews are saying, right? This is what the rabbis are saying, you know? So this is, you know, Kelsum really doesn't even have a dog in this fight between Judaism and Christianity. He introduces a Jew who enters into a personal discussion with Jesus and speaks in a very childish manner altogether, unworthy of the gray hairs of a philosopher. So an ad hoc against the Jewish person. Let me endeavor to the best of my ability to examine his statements and show that he does not maintain throughout the discussion the consistency due to the character of a Jew. Okay, so Origen is basically giving this little ad hoc pro prologue saying this guy's not worthy to be a Jew because he says these mean things about Jesus. For he represents him disputing with Jesus and confuting him, and he thinks, on many points. And in the first place, he accuses him of having invented his birth from a virgin. Now, that's very interesting. Because we do see in the New Testament, Jesus is having a dialogue with, the, with some Jewish people and um, with some Pharisees. And they actually say, we are not born of fornication, basically as a dig at Jesus, which is basically showing that that's what the others believed. That's what his Jewish contemporaries believed. Not that he was born from a virgin, but rather his mother fornicated and got pregnant. Okay. So we even see like some, some reference to that in the Christian Bible. Having invented his birth from a virgin and upbraids him with being born in a certain Jewish village of a poor woman of the country who gained her subsistence by spinning and who was turned out of doors by her husband, a carpenter by trade, because she was convicted of adultery. Now, isn't that interesting? This is what the Jewish contemporaries were saying. Basically, this is the story. This virgin birth thing you're hearing about this so-called man-god messiah? No, no, no. This is actually what happened. Jesus' mother ran around, and... The carpenter, right, that, that actually stays in the New Testament, which is funny. Uh, the carpenter, Joseph, had, she was convicted of adultery for running around on him and getting pregnant. And that after being driven away by her husband and wandering about for a time, she disgracefully gave birth to Jesus. An illegitimate child, a momser, who having hired himself out as a servant in Egypt on account of his poverty, and having there acquired some miraculous powers okay so it's saying they're basically what the what the jewish person is arguing here is listen we knew the guy we saw the guy we lived around him okay we experienced him the story of him being birthed from a virgin in some miraculous fashion it's bunk what actually happened his mom ran around the husband put her away she was poor because she now had no husband and she's a convicted adulterer, so goes down to Egypt. The son, after being born, now has to make some money to help stay on the feet. And he learns some sorcery from the Egyptians. And we can actually see in Exodus, the Egyptian sorcerers are quite powerful. They can make the same miracles that Moses does. The golden calf incident, we see that it's actually Egyptian sorcerers that bring the calf to life as it jumps out of the vat, right? Um, so to continue, that he acquired some miraculous powers whilst working as a servant 
in Egypt on account of how poor they are. And as he acquires these powers, the Egyptians pride themselves in their sorcery, right? I mean, let's, let's even think of some esoteric works like the Corpus Hermeticum and, and these type of things. They're found in Egypt, right? So these esoteric traditions are really no stranger when it comes to Egypt, okay? So he returned to his own country, highly elated on account of them. He's basically on his high horse because now he has these sorcerer-like powers. And by means of these, proclaimed himself as God. Hmm. Is this starting to make sense? Is this starting to make sense, people? That what you're seeing, what you're seeing in the New Testament is just a mythologized version of this? Is it starting to make sense? Why would you have to make up a virgin birth story? Well, because you're... <laughs> because the woman's a tramp and had a legitimate kid. Why would you have to... Why would you have to go so deep into um, an account where the Jews want to stone you for making a divinity claim while you're doing these miracles? Right? One of the one of the early one of the birth narratives, Luke says that he went to Egypt to get away from Herod. Right? So we're we're seeing we're seeing that there there are in fact some spillovers. Okay. We even see in Matthew that the wise men that come are magi, sorcerers from the east. Right? We just did sorcerer Jesus not long ago. Now, as I cannot allow anything said by unbelievers to remain unexamined, but must investigate everything from the beginning, I give it as my opinion that all these things worthily harmonize with the predictions that Jesus is the Son of God. So, Origen is basically saying, like, um, those, those approaches given by Kelsum on, you know, on behalf of this Jewish person who he's citing, yeah, we can harmonize that. So, who are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the people that are in Europe, the people that are under the influence of Pauline doctrine and all these different things? Or are we going to believe the people that were actually around him, the generation that was actually around him, experienced these divinity claims, right? These Jewish, these Jewish judges, the people who said, listen, we don't care about your miracles, we care about what you're saying about yourself. And then you have this, this Jewish person at the time of, of origin saying, yeah, yeah, he went to Egypt, he learned some sorcery, came back, made divinity claims, and we tried to stone him, right? So I'm just saying, when we, when we see throughout the New Testament that the Jews are truly demonized, things like this might be why. If, if you have every Christian scholar in the book saying that Yes, the New Testament is full of mythology. Full of mythology, right? People that used to be Christians began studying the, studying the New Testament really wholeheartedly and led them out of Christianity and even led them to say, like, listen, this is a mythology book. This isn't history. And why the, why the vicious attacks against the Jews and the horrible anti-Semitism in the New Testament? Well, because they had the true story. You have to demonize the enemy. That's typical war propaganda. That's typically pro typical propaganda in any situation, right? You have to dehumanize and belittle your opponent so you aren't afraid to, you know, do what's necessary in a more military type context. You know, think about the Crusades and so on. They were they were chanting these verses, right? The demonization of the Jews, the synagogue of Satan and the sons of the devil and so on. Um, you only need to really make those claims and truly make these ad hoc demonizing claims. Why else? Because they had the real story. And like I said, Jesus understood, hey, I'm about to get stoned because I'm not doing the right thing and they're acting according to what the God-given authority by Torah says they can do. So, 
hope that hope that was clear. Hope that helps out, and I hope that makes some sense. Um, scared Jesus, everybody. He he knew he was wrong. He uh, he saw the stones get picked up, and he ran away. Okay, but I'm Steve Eisenhower. This was the Exodus Project. Until next time, have a good one, everybody.